Well, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Rachel Marcus. I work at ODI and um, represent the Align platform. I'd like you to welcome you to today's webinar. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, we have participants registered from 23 countries, and um, it's wonderful that you could join us for what I think is going to be a very rich and insightful discussion um, with panelists from across the South Asia region. As you may know, Align is funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and going forward will also be funded by Global Affairs Canada. So we're very grateful for their support, which has enabled us to develop the platform and to put this webinar on. Um, Align is a global community for sharing knowledge and insights on what works to change uh, harmful gender norms and um, has been visited by people from over 165 countries and territories. Um, this partnership, we have a partnership with ICRW who have led our work on uh, masculinities and um, I'll shortly be handing over to, to Ravi Verma who, uh, who has, has led that work and needs no introduction um, with his, um, all his work in this area. So I just wanted to mention that um, Align is both a, a website with a number of resources on all aspects of gender norms and a specific theme on masculinities, which you can find from the by the drop down menu on the home page. And um, you know, we have synthesized knowledge through guides, but we also welcome uh, inputs and resources from um, everybody working in this area, whether that be reports or videos or blogs or case studies based on your experience, we would really welcome um, a wide sharing of experience of different kinds of work that people are doing in this area and approaches that you've taken, reflections on it and so on. And, um, you know, this webinar is very much intended in that that spirit of, of dialogue um, and learning about what is and what isn't working and what are the different challenges that people face in working to change gender norms in their different contexts. So I'm delighted to hand over to Dr. Ravi Verma of ICRW, who will be the moderator for this um, this webinar, and he in turn will be introducing our panelists and um, asking them various questions, which will be the dialogue format for this webinar. So thank you, Ravi, and thank you everybody else who's participating today. Oh, and sorry, one other thing in terms of housekeeping. Um, we, have, we have a chat box, and so if you have questions, please do raise them in there. And after the Q&A with the panelists, then there'll be an open Q&A with participants. And so we'll be picking up the questions from that. Thank you, Ravi. Ravi, you're on mute. Oh, I'm, I'm unmuted. Why? Yeah. Is it, can you hear me? Yes. yes? <laughs> okay. Uh, all right. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you so much. It's such a privilege to be part of this webinar. I really thank ICRW team and the Align to put this together. And also a privilege to be part of this uh, galaxy of four uh, male activists who have spent all their life working with men and boys, you know, for last about 20, 25 years. I have known all of them in one capacity or the other. So it's so good to be with all of them together, coming from four different uh, countries of South Asia, bringing very different perspectives and very different kind of challenges in these four countries of South Asia, prominent countries. Uh, <clears throat> so my what I would do is, as already explained by uh, Rachel, that there would be a set of questions that we would begin asking in the format of dialogue. But before I do that, I'll give you each one minute each to introduce yourself, just very brief as to who you are, what have you done, just elevator pitch. Can, can we begin with uh, Babar? No particular. Yeah, th thank you, Ravi. It's indeed a great privilege to be part of this uh, webinar. Uh, my name is Babar Bashir, and uh, uh, I'm a feminist. I'm, I'm, I'm proud to be a feminist, first thing, I think. And because I have been working with the women's rights organization for the last uh, 15, 17 years. Uh, the organization I am associated with is Rosen. It's a national NGO. We are based in Islamabad. And 
men masculinities and gender based violence is one of the core areas of our work and in terms of my special interest and is mostly in terms of like working with men in uniform and also young men and boys in the at the community level so this is something that i have been uh, doing and also been struggling with this whole process being a man like it's, 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 it's a difficult process. Thank you, thank you, Babar. I think we would have a chance to hear all about that struggle as we move along. Uh, Intiaz, bhai, please, can you? You unmute yourself, please. Oh, sorry, 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 sorry. Unmute. Where is that? No, I am unmuted, right? Yeah. No. Can you hear me? Is that? Yeah. Hello. Yes, yes. Please. Hello. Okay, thank you. So I teach in the Department of Women and Gender Studies at the University of Dhaka. Uh, I have been working as a, a learner or teacher in this department for the last 20 years almost. And I have set up a center called Center for Men and Masculinity Studies, uh, which is uh, uh, basically NGO, but we uh, do a lot of experimental research on men, engaging men and boys to empower women and prevent violence against women and girls. Uh, but from that, I have been um, engaged with the feminist movement since my student life. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Anandji, will you please introduce yourself? Thank you, Ravi, for bringing me here. It's a great uh, privilege to be in this uh, webinar as a panelist from Nepal. Uh, my name is Anand Tamang. Uh, I'm the founding director of a research organization called CREPA, Center for Research on Environment, Health and Population Activities, which is based in Kathmandu. We have established our organization uh, 25 years ago, but I myself uh, have over 39 years of experiences, uh, research experiences, first 10 years in uh, India, uh, working for the ORG, now that ORG is no more there. Uh, I and my organization, we are working mostly in the issue of reproductive health and rights for women and on gender and gender-based violence. We have uh, pioneered many of the uh, evidence-based uh, policy for Nepal, including legalization of abortion in 2002, and also like uh, introduction of a national strategy for ending child marriage. And now we have uh, developed a national strategy for the government of uh, Nepal on ending uh, sun preference and gender-based uh, gender uh, you know, abortion in the country. So thank you. I look forward to, you, uh, yeah. to your question. Thank, thank you. you. So Satish, sir. Thank you, Ravi. Uh, my name is Satish, uh, presently uh, living in Delhi, working with Center for Health and Social Justice. Um, I am a human rights activist. It started my work from 35 years and before with Gandhian movement and part become the part of the social development issues. Last 20 years, I am working with men and masculinity and trying to understand the men, their need and how they can join the whole uh, active, activist of activism of the equality and how equality can be helpful for men also. So this is my uh, learning journey is going on. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Well, just to, <clears throat> I think you all have set the context in some ways. Uh, the, <clears throat> the larger big picture purpose of this webinar, which we think is going to be slightly different from many other webinars or, or meetings that we have witnessed, we have participated in last many years on men engagement, is that uh, in last 20 years, we have seen a, lo a huge movement on this on this particular issue of engaging men and uh, boys. There was, a, there was a time when we were questioning as to why should they be engaged and is there a, uh, is that uh, a risk to engage with men and boys? What does it mean? But I think we have come a long way. Everyone recognizes that uh, in the holistic understanding of gender, men and masculinities do constitute an important part of the, uh, of the construct. So why is no more an issue? And there's a lot of experiment and a lot of work has happened. But uh, the question is that, uh, have we done enough in terms of understanding how do we engage men? What are the, uh, what are the areas that we have 
conveniently glossed over while engaging men and boys. You know, for example, how often do we really uh, engage in a confrontational mode to understand and to give messages that men need to give up privileges that they have? How often do we talk about privileges as, uh, as something that men have and gender equality is actually uh, is an issue, it is a movement where men need to understand that they are talking from a position of advantage and when it comes to becoming equal, there are certain privileges to be given up. I, I do not know whether we, we raise that, those kind of issues or not and if we raise and how do we raise and where, where do we get the uh, uh, kind of responses that we need to. So that, that's one, uh, I thought that we will we call them as sticky areas of conversation with, with men. Uh, the other, other piece that has always bothered and has sort of uh, 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 has been a, a, a part of this, this discourse is how do we situate positive masculinity in the masculinity discourse? Does positive masculinity really mean that there is an element of masculinity that need to be preserved does it mean that it does, uh, it, it will continue to be an instrumental in some ways in order to uh, bring about shifts and changes? Are, are we conveniently latching on to this whole terminology in order to make sure that men get into it, into the discourse and they, and some amount of their manliness is preserved somewhere, which, uh, which is a counterproductive in long run. And we have seen a lot of, uh, a lot of programs that have focused on men as, someone who need to just, you know, just manage their anger or manage their violence and, and they, can, they can be brought back into the equality framework has in fact over the long run been counterproductive because it has, it has given them a sense of uh, new ways of controlling as I was reading studies. So the point is that a lot of, lot of work that have engaged men have in some ways been convoluted to produce results that go in favor of men and boys uh, in repositioning their power and are we questioning them? Are we really uh, creating that kind of dissonance? Are we creating that kind of a uh, tension? And I'm using this word uh, 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 deliberately because I think a lot of change, a real change needs to, if I can use the word real change, if the transformation has to happen, then it has to come from the position of discomfort, not from a position of comfort. And are we creating that that space of discomfort? And then the third piece in this whole uh, discourse is what has been the backlash at the macro level, the, the the political economy, the larger interest groups have uh, have pushed back this discourse of gender equality because it doesn't serve their purpose. Longer. So depoliticizing uh, masculinity has has its what does it mean? And does it really uh, serve the purpose for men? So I'll, I'll just stop here because I think you guys have to contribute a lot and bring, I can only question, I'm in a comfortable position to raise questions, but you have to really answer. So uh, I, what I would do is, <clears throat> given this kind of a, uh, a background of, of raising our head and our uh, uh, you know issues beyond the comfort level, um, I, the, I have four questions and I'll go one by one and I just you get about two minutes to respond to each one of them uh, and then we come back uh, if there are further questions. For example, uh, my, my first question is, how have men and boys in your country reacted to movements and programs that aim to promote gender equity? What have been the sticky areas that result in backlash confusion and struggle and why. Barber referred to the issue of my struggle as, as, as a man, as an individual level, but I think there is a larger struggle beyond individual at the structural level on, on this. So I, so I, if you get this question clear, the question is how have men and boys in your country reacted to movements and programs that aim to promote gender equity? What have been the sticky areas that result in backlash, confusion, and struggle, and why? And let me go in the reverse order. Um, so let me first ask Satish if you want to respond. Two minutes for you. Uh, thank you, Ravi. Uh, if I'm looking the work with men in India, 
um, I can see it was the very, very instrumental uh, approach earlier and uh, in actually after uh, 1994 and 95 after ICPD, the whole issue came out on the gender equality, main involvement, and the uh, and the violence, gender-based violence. Uh, the, once the work started, the same time when uh, I can uh, see the my journey from the mass of men's sex and for stopping violence against women, and the one I, I yes, officer uh, I met and uh, explained my work, but then he became very excited and told. Hey, there is a huge need to work with men because men are very much big thing. So it means there was a huge tension in men that the, if you are going to work on the equality, it means you are going to take the power there, shift them, and the, make them um, victim, survivor, and the, the issue. So this was the one thing. So we can say also the work is spreading from developmental approach on health and HIV and care, truly, and I have seen my, my journey through Maswa and Yari Dosti uh, and uh, then other projects. The, uh, certainly, the, uh, it was easy to start the whole discussion on violence against women, but the, it, it was not possible to, it means the destination cannot be the ending violence against women. Destination was much, much uh, far away, which was the equality. And the equality, uh, I, I am the, it was also uh, not easy to start the equality because the calculation was that the men have to share the privilege. But without sharing the privilege, how equality can be started? And there was a huge dis discussion and the confusion within, uh, with the feminist group, women organization, and the people, those are working with the men also, that the question of why men will will be ready to share their privilege. Uh, this was the one thing. The other thing may be creating the sharing of the privilege is not going to uh, create the more power, accumulate the more power, more privilege, more opportunity. So this was the uh, dilemma is, I, I I don't think that is resolved. That, but we have moved that the from engaging men in women's health, in development, in workload, uh, in violence against women, but we have to move also on the issue of the property rights, that the issue of the right to choice. So yeah. that the, I think okay. the journey is going on. So thank you. We'll come later. Yeah, yeah we'll come back. But I think you have to. Uh, you, have, you just keep in mind that we also need to. You need to respond as to what has has there been a pushback from men on this in in your experience. Okay, Anand, will you please? Respond to the question. Mute, unmute, unmute, please. <laughs> unmute. Okay, uh, sorry. Uh, Nepal, as in many South Asian countries, uh, we have a patriarchal dominant society. And uh, the society, especially men, have internalized the uh, the basic issue about uh, the masculinity, their superiority over, you know, the opposite sex. And it's also the uh, women also have begun to internalize that, yes, our husband or men are superior to be. And they have the decision-making power. So this is how the balance of, you know, the power uh, normally plays in the society, which where, where the beneficiaries, the upper hand are with the men. Now, it's with our deeply rooted social, cultural norms, and which has been also supported by the uh, other various factors that indirectly or directly, you know, put men above the, uh, the uh, gender equity balance. So this is where we need to challenge and engaging men in uh, boys is one of the good, uh, you know, initiatives or associated strategy or a program that has helped to bring some level of uh, gender equality between these two, you know, I should say not sex, but within the two gender, the men and the women. Now, what is happening in uh, Nepal is that 
our government, uh, once we had the new constitution, which was after we had the federal system of government, we have a new constitution in 2015 that uh, guarantees uh, right, women's rights, including gender equality. Okay, and there are many uh, uh, enactment and acts have been passed, as many as 105 or more enacted over the um, progress, you know, the, uh, that helps to empower women. And one of the important uh, act was the 2018 Act on uh, Safe Motherhood and Reproductive Health Rights, where right to abortion has been further granted and, and right for the uh, adolescents and women. Now, some of these rights are being accepted by, the, by men, uh, you know. For example, uh, the citizenship rights which has been discussed about Satis, he brought in Nepal, uh, the 2017 Act have further allowed um, daughters to inherit their rights irrespective of her marital status or divorce, you know. That is one of the a uh, few good examples where men have started to agree and also support women's uh, rights. So this also that contributed to gender uh, equality in, in Nepal. So you mean that in, despite being such deeply patriarchal, Nepalese men have been supportive of this legislative um, initiatives. That's what you're saying. Yes. So not yeah. much of a apparent pushback as, as you expected perhaps, but we'll come back to that. Imtiaz. What is your experience in, in your activism? The two, two different yeah. points. One is uh, if we talk about movement, then the point is very different. And when you talk about programs, that's different. Movement okay. is more about men participating voluntarily, realizing that uh, there should be equity uh, in this world. And that is still far behind, um, I think, where we are now, because men are not really thinking um, I would say collectively, which is noticeable at this moment, we see uh, some, maybe a few men who are really uh, still trying to be part of this movement voluntarily. And it's very, very few in number, even after 12 or 15 years of uh, the journey with men engagement. Now, if I come to the programs and, and to this point, I would also like to mention about this man engaged networks role. Initially, in 2005-06, we, so we were part of this network, and unfortunately, that's where the confusion arises, because it is it has more evolved into a development circus, and you see a lot of pushing, pulling, politics, all these things um, are now there, and that's where confusion arises. So whenever there are the issues of who would get what benefit, then you see all kind of uh, activism dismantled very quickly and we see uh, we show our face as men um, and that's where also I would say the ethos of the movement that should be there actually vanishes very quickly but also uh, even uh, these are very negative words but I must also admit that this was very important to initiate the discussion around men and masculinities and how we can really think of women empowerment in modern and engaging men and boys. In terms of programs, I would very quickly say that men are very, uh, very much eager to accept from the Center for Men and Masculinity Studies, we organized, we in fact tested three different uh, initiatives. One is called a Brave Man Campaign, another one is Campus Zero Cafe, another one is uh, Pio Baba or Dear Father Campaign. And all these were experimental research. And what we have seen, I just share one information very quickly. Uh, in the initial uh, stage, when we uh, try to understand gender equity uh, and we were working with, with boys, we found a majority of the boys had very gender inequitable attitude. But after one year of in intervention, we found almost 70% of the boys were thinking very di differently. So this also means that when you uh, design a program very carefully, then definitely uh, change is possible. It's not that change is impossible, but if you look at the programs, it is unfortunately to me, it is the old wine in new bottle. You are only engaging men without having any critical theory of change, without having um, any, I would say, successful locally tested models of 
engaging men so that they become self-reflective and understand the importance of a stepping into the uncomfortable zone of being a man. And that's yeah, where yeah. I would say really like he's lagging behind. And lot of confusion, backlash are there. We'll we'll come back to this because I think all three of you have made very important point. And sec next question I think is is about digging deeper into what you all said. So thank you very much, uh, Bauer, uh, from your experience in with people in uniform. You have been working with the most difficult groups of men. So what has been your experience of uh, on these issues? Yeah, th thank you, Ravi. I think, uh, I mean, I would divide my uh, question in two parts, basically. One is like looking at Pakistan from a time frame pre-2018 and now uh, post-2018. And I feel like 2018 is a kind of a very decisive year in terms of how we as a society and men in particular look at the whole discourse of gender equality in Pakistan, basically. 2018 is a period, uh, the time when prior to 2018, basically, we have been celebrating International Women's Day with the name of International Women's Day. And from 2018, it has been now become Aurat March. And from Aurat March to Aurat Azadi March. And you know, I mean, the, the friends who can, I mean, uh, since uh, it's also very much uh, understandable in uh, Hindi as well, like the Aurat Azadi March, are the three words that have, I, I would say, really shaken uh, the very much the foundation of patriarchy, basically, in Pakistani context, basically. So this is the first time I feel like where men, now they are, they, that their discomfort is, is, is more obvious than, than it has been uh, uh, in, in the era of uh, post-2018, basically. So this is one part I can really want to highlight because the struggle pre-2018, it was subtle, resistance mm -hmm. and backlash was there, but its man and manifestation was not so obvious. But now its manifestation is very much, very much out, out there. And, that, and just to add into that, the discourse that has been very much out there, now it has come entered into the bedroom, basically, I would say. Because when I say bedroom, yeah. it's because there are two slogans that I, I really want to highlight over here in Pakistani context. One slogan is, Mera Jisam Meri Marzi. And I know mm -hmm. it's my body, my choice. I mean, and it's interesting is, <clears throat> like when it is my body, my choice, interestingly, people have no problem with that. But when it translated, it became more indigenous, and Mera Jisam Meri Marzi, then the whole control of on women's body that has been there, that has been a kind of a entitlement and privilege that men has learned, now they they have asked that no, you have to unlearn that that process basically, and then the discomfort started over there. And the second point, second uh, slogan, which says, "Apna khana khud garam karo," it means heat your own food. It's not a problem in that, but again, this is the first time where men has been asked, "Look, look, the whole rigid roles they have been experiences, and the kind of." Uh, the kind of, uh, you can say, the, the privileges they had that were invisible to them. Now they are becoming visible to them. And now when the privileges are becoming visible to them, the discomfort is increasing, basically. So this is yeah, the yeah. whole context that we're operating in, in our, and we are struggling. Here, just to conclude, I think there are three things that we have to really keep in mind. One is like how the whole, whole thing is this, is it's, uh, it's perceived, uh, the whole discourse of gender equality and uh, in Pakistani context, still we are struggling with like it is labeled as un-Islamic and shameful. The first thing that whenever you talk about the more the terms of gender equality, it's said okay, this is something that is not um, comply with the whole discourse of Islam basically. Secondly, yeah. it's like this is an agenda where the, the, the kind of uh, vulgarity is being promoted basically. And the third is where I will say this whole discourse of gender equality is actually uh, dismantling, as is, is harming the social fabric of society and most importantly, social fabric of the family. And that now, just to conclude it, the discourse that has been very much out there now has entered into the four walls. And the four walls in Pakistani context is something very important because where this is how 
women are perceived they have to be into the four walls four walls of their house basically now this they are out there so in that terms like the discussion that was more in terms of sexual harassment in terms of uh, uh, mobility in terms of right to education right to health now it this has entered into no this is not enough now the actual struggle and actual the kind of what we want is more change in the power structure and that more change in the power structure is where these kind of slogans are really hitting in that context basically yeah thank you thank you very much all for i think this uh, all at least baba you and satish uh, did allude to the point that uh, an alliance with the women's movement and feminist groups and work towards uh, promoting uh, you know uh, the women's uh, issues as a center st- center central issue is one way of addressing or at least eliciting men's reactions in ways that would perhaps address some of these uncomfortable issues and i just want to take it little farther and, and imtia said that there in fact in movement there are very few people after 15 20 years itself it, se- it seems that men don't really um, voluntarily come into these movements and and want to shift that agenda of power dynamics in some ways uh, whereas if you do programmatic from from government anand experiences that people men perhaps just support it in, uh, we do not know if those are very instrumentalist ideas that men are supporting or is it is the fundamental transformational ideas that they are supporting but then i want to take this further another level of um, of your insights on how how do we exactly pull men into this kind of discussion i mean one way is to push them to the co- you know uh, this whole discourse to a stage where the feminist framework does become the defining framework to uh, to uh, centralize these issues the other is to is to really engage uh, uh, men and their context and their realities where they can they, they can look at this entire issue for from their own from their own realities perspective where they don't have to really relate all the time only with women because it is it is essentially first an issue within themselves of defining their own masculinities and and uh, arriving at their own you know levels of hierarchy and the negotiated levels of power within themselves you know the the way the manner in which imtiaz describes the the um, uh, men engage movement it shows the diversities among men themselves working for these issues struggling for their own power uh, spaces and i don't want to go into detail on that but it i'm not really disheart- dis- i'm so happy that you made this point because this is this such a realistic reflection of how uh, uh, different groups of men then when come together they have to first sort out their own issues so so i'll just stop here and i i just want to hear from you as to how do you how do you see this men's groups and men's forums and men activity activists have addressed this issue from their perspective for their in irrespective of the women's movement as a defining framework so anyone can start whoever feels um, like well, jumping let me, in let me start for two minutes uh, let me please start every... yeah okay um, may i yeah please please okay please, first yeah. of all i really don't i really don't think that uh, there is any point to segregate between men's issue and uh, feminist agenda i mean when you really understand properly uh, feminist framework then i think that framework is enough to really solve even the race class ethnicity and all other intersectional issues which divide men into different subgroups the issue is how do we really include men into the discussion of gender equity and which is in broader term uh, gender justice and here we have two different points one between men and women as single unitary category which is very vague category in fact which never exist because all men and women are separated and segregated into different groups the other point is how do we look men as in unitary category and then try to understand what are the different struggles that men as a gender category have and here nation here the religion here class ethnicity everything actually intersect and divide men into different subgroups now my point is and and very straight away without having any theoretical discussion what i want to say the easiest solution 
for this is definitely to understand and learn from feminist movement and internalize, reflect upon the way we try to portray ourselves as men. And also in practice, we try to be men. We will have to understand that feminist movement has achieved from 100 years of struggle. And if we can go to the core of that struggle, we can definitely learn a lot from that movement and also try to understand how to deal with the problems that we have as men, the way we are raised as men. And I would stop here and I, I hope later uh, I will give a specific example to it. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Uh, anyone else who, who wants to make a point on this, Satish? Yeah, okay. So, um, I think uh, we have to understand and what we learned that the whole uh, struggle and movement was the gender equality uh, carried out by the women. That path cannot be for the men also. Because for women, being a, being a marginalized section, there was a huge immediate achievement possibility where the uh, with the men we have to uh, start the own power and privilege reflection and and find out what uh, what are the negotiable point where men also feeling not the what you can say not the loser not achiever so uh, it doesn't mean when they are putting their effort and time and energy for equality they have to share something and we have to collect what is the triggering point for the men to help them to moving out there uh, and supporting each other. So men need to support each other. That's the very essential. Other is men also have to use some mirror. In the, there's a huge potential that the power can be accumulated and misused. So how, where they can use mirror and that mirror can be used in family and out of the family also. So this was the one thing. Uh, certainly yeah. we also find that the huge pushback, if you see, uh, sometimes I also feel myself also confused that the, sometimes equality looks like very fashion, that everybody wants equality, but what is the result coming on? So if you see the, uh, uh, like dowry act is diluted uh, even the uh, everybody want to uh, ensure the safe workplace but the women's number the women's at the corporate at the working place is reducing so women's participation or women's opportunity from the uh, in the public sphere economic sphere political sphere is redu uh, reducing so that need to be understood also it means there is some fear in the men also. And uh, we can yeah. see in India, there is a safe family foundation who always try to raise the issue that there is a men victim and they need to be supported or they harassed. There's so many things going on. So there's a, and we can also see like uh, women commission also uh, uh, asked and ministry also asked to uh, create a window for men also. So it means the one way there is a huge fear also in men, uh, which is uh, lead to the whole issue of the equality that is going on. Yeah. yeah. No, no, this is important. And Anand, that Bhavar, I really uh, want to ask you who, if you have similar kind of an observation on uh, a kind of a backlash or a sense of binary that gets created in this whole discourse between men and women, no matter how much you try to take the discourse beyond what Amtiaz says, beyond being a man or women, uh, it does create that kind of a, a situation. How, how does one take it beyond that? How, what do you do to uh, engage men and boys in a discussion or discourse which really helps them to go beyond this? Uh, or let me put the question someone has asked here. Uh, what does gender mean beyond, you know, beyond gender what does masculine identity mean beyond gender you know we are saying that if gender is something which does which really dismantles this identities of men and women then what does it mean to masculine identities especially beyond gender do they feel are they also scared do they feel threatened by a, an identity less kind of a um, um, 
situation where what are men then afraid of if if uh, equality and um, is the platform what 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 are they going to lose there uh, may i just step in here um, in nepal in our society uh, and based on our experiences working with the men and boys in our programs uh, we did not find any agitations or the men and masculinity being threatened you know uh, in fact the focus is more on social inclusion uh, in nepali society because we have a diverse uh, you know caste ethnicity and some caste ethnicity are highly uh, deprived of economic and social opportunities than uh, some minor some other groups so the more focus is more on women empowerment uh, gender equality and social inclusion, and in in such in such a uh, situation, the men and masculinity, they feel that they are intact instead of being threatened at all. Right, and this is one of the good, uh, uh, you know, example for the Nepali society. Except, of course, there are certain uh, caste and community groups where there is always a. Uh, you know, predominant, uh, you know, position of men in all stages and, and just because of the fact that their culture, their practice and their social norms also encourage some of the uh, behavior which are not uh, gender equitable, you know, uh, behavior. So otherwise is for Nepal, these are not a, a much an issue for the men and masculinity issues. They are more focused on gender equality and try to upbring the status of women and girls. Okay. That's so good to hear. I think we have to learn a lot from Nepal. Uh, Babar, do you have uh, do you have an observation on this? Uh, yeah, yeah, I think, yeah, Ravi, I mean, it's very interesting to listen to Satish and then and Tiad and Anna. From my experiences, like there are three things that really want to highlight over here. One is like looking working with men uh, from a, we have been working uh, more from a power but from a powerlessness perspective basically okay when i say okay. powerlessness perspective actually this is very much linked with the work that we have been doing with men in uniform you know like in, in, in generic the person who is who is in a uniform and he is a man as well so the lot of power he carries but at the same time when we talk to them okay what are the different kind of powerlessnesses they have experienced in their life, and that powerlessness actually helped them to connect to the powerlessness of others, basically. And others is not only women, but powerlessness of other men as well. The other, so this is one aspect. Like we have to analyze this whole discussion from a powerlessness perspective as well. Secondly, I feel like in my experience, there are there are there's a kind of a disconnect between whole whole what we talk about and the individual self of a man and when i search individual self of a man it's basically like okay where he is positioned and in, in, in socialized in the whole context basically and and his own self has been raised in a way where many times he, he 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 is not comfortable at all but it is there it is there it, it has it has been framed in a way that he has learned to go along with that uh, self because having all this uh, discomfort with, with them as well uh, uh, at the same time. Basically. And thirdly, I feel like we have to really look into the experiences and learn from the, experience, the violence that men, has, men, men and boys experience in life. Because the violence they experience, it's, it's has a, it's had, it has a different kind of a connotation and different, different kind of dynamics, dynamics, I would say, basically. And that also needs to be explored because this can also be a kind of an entry point and a kind of a connecting point, I would say. Like where, how a man and a boy has experienced violence, any kind of violence in his, in his life, basically. And in that, what he has learned from that, that experience, basically. And how that experience is helping him to connect to other and as a, as a whole, as a whole as a human being, I would, I would say, basically. So these are the three things I really want to add in this discourse, basically, like how we approach this whole uh, process of engaging men and boys. Yes, yes, and th that is the that was the core crux of this entire webinar, and wanted to know from your, ex I mean, the experiences of this such such rich 
uh, activists working on the ground as to how do you engage in these difficult uh, conversations. So, uh, so it's good to know theoretically this, and I uh, I come back to Imtiaz because he said, uh, and please, uh, if Imtiaz, you can reflect also on the points that Bhavan made. How do you, uh, if, because you wanted to say, talk about some examples there, and uh, so how do you begin to talk about powerlessness perspective or a perspective where uh, individual, uh, you know, when you look at the individual lessness, that's what you, uh, Bhavan said. I think that's a very interesting phrase. And uh, and also, uh, the, how do men experience violence themselves? And what does it mean when they experience violence? Why do they perpetrate the same violence against others? You know, if, if that is, uh, it's so interesting that violence begets violence. Uh, we have all known theoretically, but then how does it translate into masculine identities is, is very, very interesting. So, so Intiaz, you had left your point at some point and you want to take it further through examples. Yeah, um, let me take the last point that you made that of why men uh, commit violence against men and how can we relate it with masculinities and the construction of masculinities. I mean, I have my whole thesis done on this. I did my PhD oh. in Amsterdam and you know that. So I'm not going to tell the whole thesis, but honestly speaking, if you look at the South Asian perspectives, we have very interesting um, the construction of masculinities. On the one hand, if you look at the uh, colonial construction of masculinities, and you know there are quite a lot of studies on this in uh, uh, in India on colonial masculinities in Bengal. That Bengali, I can I, can, I will now come particularly to Bangladesh and Bengal. Uh, they told they talked about us as effeminate. That Bengali men are effeminate because they are very emotional. And you see, this is a construction which was done by the British, and it was this was very purposive. Interestingly, when I worked in Bangladesh, what I found that men now try to be very macho, very, very violent, and it has become integral part of becoming man. It was not like that. I heard myself when I was young that when a, a man was beating his wife in my neighborhood, all the men was coming together and telling him, are you a man? Why are you beating up women? A man never beats women. And now you will see all over the South East except Nepal that Beating your wife has become an integral part of your man. And this has been done over the last, I would say, 40, 50, or 60 years. And if you compare this with, and I'm talking particularly about Bangladesh, with the way that this discourse was constructed, you see that global masculinity transaction, which is very much interrelated with capitalist aggression, is a very interlinked. So we are not going into that big debate. Now, the point is, how can we change it? That's the most important yeah. part. And what we did, interestingly, Bengali men are also very powerlessness when it is about fatherhood. And what I did, I experimented a research, which was initially funded by uh, the government of Bangladesh through UNAP, and the second one was by Prabhunda US. And thanks to Gary for helping me to do that. And we worked with um, in 100 villages. And what we have found that when you enter using fatherhood, as an entry point, then men really opened up themselves. So what oh. happened? Uh, we have we have experimented that a man who is very macho, when you help that man to understand that if you beat your wife before your son, your son will hate you. Believe me, that man never beats his wife before his son. So this is one point. Then second, when you say that when you beat your wife, and even if it is not before your son, at certain point, your son comes to know it, if he comes to know it, he will hit you. That also works, worked. So fatherhood as an entry point can be an excellent point to entry to realize men that they are powerless because son preference is still very high in this region. So the same uh, point that that was that is there to make feel men feel empowered, you can use the same point to entry and make men powerless and then really help him to be the real power holder. Because when you have a happy family, then you are the real, real powerful man. That's one point. The second point is, believe me, apart from this, I tried a lot of different other methods, including including men in feminist movement, and that doesn't work. Men are not changed. Men, men don't want to change them. So it's very difficult for a man who is fully grown up. When I say fully grown up, I mean after 20. Before that, you can still have a lot of opportunities, avenues to mold their thinking and change that. And, and we have seen 
we worked with two specific programs. One is called Brave Man Campaign, and I will like now share my screen. Um, I hope this will take. I, I I beg a little bit more time to to talk now. I hope uh, Robbie will Just, not mind to give me yeah another, one two more minutes. Minute. Yeah, in another seven minutes we will open the forum for question and answer. So I want to yeah. give last chance to even Anand because he mentioned cast, and I don't want to let him go okay. without. Can you, can you see the screen now? Can you see the screen now? Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Yeah. So uh, while I talk, let me just share my screen with you, and you will see that when what we did, uh, it, this experiment was done uh, seven years before with with a group of boys who were uh, in the rural areas, and now many of these boys are working with me uh, for gender equity. So what I have found, you when you invest boys. That gives you better result with regard to generational change. But the problem is, uh, and this this was uh, this fund was um, made available through UNDP, and we could we could do that. And but unfortunately, what happened later on, we did not have funding to experiment it to a ten years period or to conduct a longitudinal study. But what I can say, undoubtedly, if you work with young boys. Then it gives a better result, and motherhood can be a very interesting entry point for for these boys. Because what I see, I have seen, in the beginning when he asked the boys what your parents do, they said father works, ma mother stays at home. But when we made this boy to work with their mother and help them in household work, the next session most of these boys told that my mother also worked. So that can be a very interesting entry point and help them to question to this world that why there is gender equity. Uh, gender inequality. So I will step stop here. Thank you. No, no. Thank you so much. Thank you for being brief and also very succinct about your point. So thank you. And this, I so two two more uh, question points before I close this particular section of the discussion and open to the uh, question answer. One, I just want to go back to uh, Anand because he he did mention that there are certain caste groups where. The masculinity does exist in some ways, and I'm not really cornering you on that, Anand. Believe me, because I'm, I'm just inspired by the point that Intiaz made that there is a colonial mas that certain masculinities have been created as subnational masculinities, and uh, they uh, they remain preserved, they are nurtured in some ways, and they continue to uh, exert their own power dynamics in in in, in differently. In different transformative ways, but they exist. And and you did uh, you did allude to that point when you said there are certain caste it does exist. So would you uh, would you like to elaborate a little bit as to what what kind of caste masculinities mean in Nepali context? First of all, caste is a very important factor in our demographic analysis. Uh, any evaluation of a program should done disaggregate by caste, of course. Gender, sex is there, age, uh, that becomes incomplete because caste is a very important uh, role in determining the social status, economy, education levels. So, and there is a higher level of, uh, I could say, hyper masculinity in the upper caste uh, and in the Dalit, the, the lower caste. The, the Janjatis, they have a more of a uh, dichotomy and then more, you know, uh, gender equitable relations, men and women, and there are no much of the factors about the masculinity and men. So, uh, caste uh, in the upper, uh, you know, in the upper caste are in the Hindus, the Brahmin churches, where the masculinity, the dominance of uh, the, the pujari, and how it detects about the preference of a son preference are much higher among these communities. So, it's an important factor to be reckoned with when you analyze Nepalese data. And, and, and are there people working with these caste groups to address the issues of uh, transforming men and masculinities there? Oh, yes. In like, uh, there, are, yeah, there are organizations who are exclusively working for a, uh, the caste, like for the Tarai caste, the, the Madeshi caste, which also have okay. a different you know, levels hierarchy within themselves. By language and by their place of residence, there are organizations who work against dowry systems, you know, against your child marriage, and also uh, the, the issue of uh, how to, you know, 
you address the issue of gender-based violence. So gender-based violence are quite uh, quite you know, prevalent in those communities. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So final, I have three three four minutes to go before I open. What? And I just wanted to come back to Satish uh, and just picking up again the points from what Imtiaz and Baba was saying and wanted your reflections. Uh, he mentioned a couple of way forward ideas. You know, uh, Imtiaz was talking about fatherhood as an entry point or yeah. starting young as an entry point of uh, changing, transforming some of this. In fact, uh, you yourself said that there should be a mirror that should be held on to them. And I just was wondering what that mirror looks like. Or Babar, of course, alluded in detail about that whole powerlessness kind of a, a approach that should come through some of these approaches of fatherhood. Although I was really intrigued by and was in, was very interested to hear the approach that Imtiaz described, that if you beat mother, then son will beat you. So it's kind of, um, you know, one, uh, one paradigm within which we are trying to uh, send messages, but maybe effective uh, in some ways uh, uh, to, to bring about a push back those backlash. But I just wanted to hear from you, Satish ji, as to what you think are the uh, way forward entry points that you think are emerging or, or the positive signs that you see emerging from the work. Uh, thank you, Ravi. Uh, I think in India, um, we have to uh, you have to think and analyze and learn the masculinity in a very, very uh, intersectional way. Because uh, I, I found that the people are very caring, very caring at home, but at the same time when they sit in the majority group, like Hindu, and blaming that the, all the problem is created by the Muslim, I think this is the contradictory. So it doesn't mean, in, it means that the one time, masculine, one type of masculinity used by the person, the second time and next con uh, other context, they're totally different they are using. The, even uh, if I'm looking the Bengal, and, and I have seen that the very collaborative, very ready to listen, to learn, to accommodate, but at the same time, even the working class people is struggling with their a girl child to restricting or sending early marriage just because they think that the girl will run away. So where the fear is coming out, it means the whole issue of honor of the family associated with the women and girl, that is the one area is the need to be deal. Yeah, I am working also in the with the UNICEF people and NRLM people in the Chhattisgarh, um, totally tribal area. And the belief, 12 years, 13 years boys, those are studying, have in that poorer, poorer area also, having themselves a, a smartphone, but they are not allowing or uh, are not imagining that the, their sister should have the same thing. And the fear is they will contact it, come in contact with the other boys, and this is, this will again the they are prestige of the family. So this is a tribal people, poor people, remote area. Where is their imagination? Their imagination of the uh, masculinity is very, very much in controlling and securing the honor of the uh, family, which is associated with the women. That need to be dealt out. At the same time, we have to put the discomfort also. So it means the we have to see the uh, masculinity certainly start with the one relation with the women in the in the context of the gender but the other also what is the relation with the other men tribal men muslim men other caste men how they are uh, reacting how they are learning and how they are protecting their manhood which is huge come out and this is the i think the one opportunity giving us to understand how their manhood and masculinity become in a crisis and they are how they are managing their masculinity to using the whole control and other types of control and violence and aggression are totally fail, totally unable to manage their failure. So the other thing is which we have to raise continuously that why men only learn to uh, manage the success where they learn to manage the failure. 
the whole issue of competition going on and that is a huge problem in the from the education to the every place all work is competition and and the competition is create the another types of power which they they um, leave the whole collaboration issue uh, how they live with other how they have to learn to create the space and and at least vacate that space for other also other that the women also other get the other men also so whole controlling things need to be dealt and that is going very hard at this time okay all right i mean listening to all four of you it seems that we are still a long journey i think there is a, uh, we think we have spent almost 20 25 years learned a lot gained a lot of insights but it seems that we take uh, we take two steps forward and there is still more to <laughs> gain the ground there's a lot to lot to do it's a, it's a, it's more complex and it it appears that uh, there is a much bigger power struggle that continues to feed into another level of struggle uh, but there are some areas that we that that we are achieving as well um, and there are signs that are uh, moving forward and we heard some very nice examples of you know how fatherhood or starting young could make a difference or the idea of uh, intersectional approaches by bringing parents men of different uh, groups and masculinities together to to introspect and and see what they gain and what they uh, stand to lose would also be important uh, point to uh, you know keep in mind but i think now this is uh, the time for me to uh, stop this this section of our discussion i want to do justice to lots of questions that you know we have such engaging audience here there are lots of questions here for you guys and we have another 25 minutes to go so let i'll read out those questions and uh, please uh, see who wants to jump in and please volunteer yourself and be short and uh, make sure that others also get to speak on that because i think they are all very exciting uh, so <clears throat> the first question is how is male resentment that is of women's advancement or messaging about being more sensitive or equitable mobilized in situations of backlash in your country so how how do you how is male resentment uh, mobilized in situations of backlash any well, uh, anyone i in, can i i mean in case of bangladesh yeah. there was an example very recently um there were some rape cases and what we found lot of uh, religious fundamentalist groups were actually supporting um in a way because they were blaming the victim and then we see um, men young boys i mean i'm meeting aachi young boys are coming together and and they were mobilizing themselves to protest so um and and it, it was not done by any it was not done by any uh volunteer uh, it was not done voluntarily rather there were some ngos some some org civil society organizations who helped them to mobilize so in a way um these resentments whenever there are this kind of backlashes you mobilize the people who are in in, in who are also against that backlash uh, uh, mostly young people and you you don't see a lot of lot of the uh, older people coming against that backlash Oh, that's the case in bangladesh here yeah that's very interesting i you know when it happened in india also a lot of a uh, uh, lot of young men they came on the street protesting yeah. against rape violence against women and at some point the feminists were actually questioning the intentions of many of these men who were in the forefront of that uh, mobilization because they were wondering if it is another way You know, I mean, with the power, that, that's fine. It's fine. So, so uh, you know, it it uh, so it was ta- it was seen and taking over the spaces of aggressive masculinity to you know patronize. But I think uh, anyway, uh, this is uh, this is a very, very nice way forward. Uh, anyone else who wants to respond to this, other I'll ask another question here. There is there are many questions, so you'll get a chance to 
respond to them. Uh, the other one is who are the backlash agitators and what are issues, what are other issues than gender equality do they get excited about or fight for? Very interesting question that who are the backlash agitators and what are other issues than gender equality do they get excited about or fight for? It pass, no problem. I think, uh, well, but they, yeah, yeah, Satish, please. So, I think that in India it is very essential at this time, and the whole issue then struggle come out the what is the priority issue. So, the like the livelihood is the working class, poor people, tribal people think that the livelihood need to be first taken, uh, that is the struggle. At the same time, the communal thing is going on, then there, there is a need to shift the thing. And in this situation, how we can set up some collaborative action? So when the youth come out, like the OBR is the one, yeah, other other campaign is going on, and the people at this time also people on the on the road and trying to understand, trying to involve this, uh, uh, to uh, raise the issue, to at least trying to start the understanding to what is the root cause, what is the cause of the backlash, why the backlash but, is but, going on. But, but, so, but I'm sorry, interrupting you, but tell me, how does one address this whole cultural identity piece in this, you know, because uh, gen gender equality, again, if it is construed, misconstrued as something which, uh, which is uh, uh, hurting your cultural identity or cultural norms in whichever way people understand, then it is a direct uh, uh, confrontation, and it, there's enough reason to for people to uh, get agitated about so the cultural identities and nationalism has almost taken yeah. over as a central piece of identity. And where does gender equality then? How does that fit into that discourse? And is that a matter of concern? Yeah, yeah, that is that is a matter of concern. That is the huge matter of concern, and the whole issue. If you see the whole domination of the language in the India also. In the North India thing, the, we are the India. And then, then this is the again conflict issue. And then how the uh, language issue, like the, let's say the Maratha and the non-Maratha thing going on, outer and inside going on. So that's also give the space. When the people are struggling with the, like the, you are, you are outsider or you are insider, when they are struggling there, at that time, this is also need to raise the issue of gender equality. Then at what basis you are, you are keeping out some people and when the other are trying to keep you, your cultural, on the basis of your culture keeping out to you, that is the one thing. Uh, I think that there is some sorts of common platform need to be uh, established. Yeah. Okay. Babar, are you keen to respond to this or should I move on to another question? Okay, so let me ask because I think we have another 20 minutes and then you come back to if you have. So I'll, uh, so don't, don't uh, suppress, you'll get a chance to speak on that. Uh, just tell me, this question is interesting, so I'm eager to ask this. Say that as the panel belongs to different countries with distinct governance, cultural and religious affiliation, I would like to know if the masculinity perceptions barriers to women empowerment remains same or is impacted and to what extent uh, and to what extent by the social and political structure of the country. Can, should I repeat it? As the panel belongs to the different countries with distinct governance, cultural and religious affiliation, I would like to know if the masculinity perception barriers to women empowerment remains same or is impacted and to what extent by the social and political structure of the country. So this, I think each one of you could get about a minute or to reflect on this. Babar, can we start with you or anyone? Up unmute Kali, please unmute yourself, Babar. Babar, you are not unmuted. I, uh, I have done okay. it. The point is like just to acknowledge that question, like uh, it it is like that the variation and 
the kind of differences are there. So this is not a one kind of South Asian one pack that that encompasses whole the discussion. So in Pakistani context, for instance, even within Pakistan, I would say it's not it's again very diverse. For instance, coming from a Pakhtun perspective and a Punjabi perspective and a Sindhi perspective, so things will vary, will vary, and and that variation is there. And another point that is really want to add. Like we have to look into the contestations that men have within themselves. Like here, what when I say contestations, the point is basically in our work, the most most gender equitable men, when we explore their lives, at some point of time, they have been most un like unequitable men as well, basically. So what what's that? That kind of the uh, grounds are there where, where Satish also referred like, okay, look into that area as well. That might be, this can provide us more insights. Okay, if, if it's not the same, one pack kind of a thing, it's, it's the variations and the cont uh, contradictions and the contestations are there. So, so we have to look into that contestation and then, then find out the kind of uh, entry points over there. Yeah. Anand. Do you have any reflection on this? Please unmute yourself then. Yeah. Oh, yes, uh, I also like to add with the first question about uh, discernment from the, from the men's perspective. Uh, in Nepal, as I have so in the beginning, that comparative, uh, comparatively, we have more of a that uh, agreement and uh, you know recognition of each other's strengths and weakness, and also internalization of the some of the social cultural harmful social cultural practices even by the women themselves and the uh, movement uh, uh, among the uh, uh, feminists are basically to uh, provide further opportunities and uh, you know empowerment uh, in, in terms of jobs and facilities for the women uh, and they the feminists have not revolted against or dissented against any of the uh, uh, laws and policies, except for one. And that's basically in one uh, sector of the society, uh, which have begun to uh, ob uh, you know, have their objections. Uh, it's more, more of a political gimmick um, on the, um, you know, increase, you know, the um, increase in the age, legal age of marriage for girls. Earlier it was 18 for girls and 20 for boys, but now it has been equated, uh, you know, 20 for both boys and girls. Now this particular, uh, you know, section of the society have said that, uh, in uh, saying that the, the rise in the age of marriage is a wrong decision of the government, uh, because in our society the girl need to marry by 16 or 17, uh, otherwise there will be no. Uh, grooms, you can be able to, good grooms can do, you know, you will be able to find after she is she crossed 19 or 20. So this is one of the uh, bitter resentment regarding the uh, government or the, the, the policy, the, the act that uh, legalized as it marriage for 20. That was one of the example for Nepal. Otherwise, uh, there has been much resentment. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I I am tempted to ask Imtiaz to take this to Imtiaz and Satish, but I think I'll not take this this question to you both. Where enough has been reflected, but there are other interesting uh, questions. But, but very that, quickly, but very quickly, uh, <clears throat> Ravi, uh, we yeah. were we were. Oh, what happened? I think his internet is interrupted. Uh, okay, so by the time he comes, Satish, if you want to respond to this, otherwise uh, uh, we can uh, move to the next question. Just very quick, I think the whole notion of the at current notion of the nationalism and the the way the inter industrialization is going on, this is huge, going to very badly affect the women's. Uh, uh, women in their 
इकोनॉमिक सेक्टर आई थिंक दिस इज द वन बिग थिंग तो द वायलेंस इन द जनरल इज इंक्रीजिंग whether the communal violence and the road rage is going that is really going to restrict the women mobility i think this is the one thing all right uh, uh, we are we are i hope we get back imtiaz here something very interesting but there is an interesting question and okay imtiaz is back i'm so happy imtiaz uh, is here yeah. so why don't you continue imtiaz we can't hear you please unmute ya yeah. <clears throat> okay all right so by the Why time yas fix can i ask you know because there there's only 10 minutes left now yeah. and i need to uh, ask a couple of questions from the audience i really think audience is engaged here one of them has asked uh, how do men see uh, toxic max masculinity do they see it as an incentive to work towards gender equality and be part of the feminist movement or are efforts at moving away from toxic masculinity also seen as an attack on their manhood so uh babar you because you can you take on this question yeah how how can see yes toxic masculinity do they see it as an attack on their working against is an attack on manhood that's interesting yeah i, I think I mean, if you look at from a very uh, men's perspective like yes this is this is seen like this because this is how In 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 our context, for instance, how a man should be, or how look like a man, and if you have to look like a man in that context, one way of uh, that process is to manifest your masculinity in in a toxic way, basically. So if you are taking away from that from uh, the toxic mentality from from that man, it's basically you are taking away the manlyhood from. Him. So, the, so there is a yeah. struggle basically. So, I think that that's a good point. Like, yes, this is how the men are struggling in that way. Of, okay, we have because because they have to prove. Because you know, one way of uh, being a man is you have to prove your masculinity, and you prove you prove your masculinity is one way is uh, uh, being the the farm 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 of ma toxic masculinity basically. So, this is how they are interlinked basically. Yeah. That's right, and that means there is a there is a linked linked question here. Do women Uh, react to trans how do women react to transform men then i mean do women really want the macho men to remain in the societal construct maybe they see macho men to be the to be their protectors yeah just to add one thing like, like uh, ravi i mean you have done some research with us almost 7 uh, 8 years back yeah. and re very recently uh, we we did this images in pakistan at the international men and gender equality survey interestingly this question very much correlate with that majority of the women i mean when they were asked like how how what kind of man they would like and 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 then the, the, the kind of man they want is of course the one who is the protector the one who is who is who has the kind of a but body is like very very macho so and of course the other thing is linked with the financial stability as well so i would say like yes the perception of a man and a manlyhood is not very different among women and men it's very much more or less same in in, in both cases yeah. okay this is interesting satish you wanted to react because this is a very interesting paradox you want to bring gender transform men for the benefit of women as if we take instrumental approach and then you have a perspective from um, a perspective that says that even macho manhood is is desired by by right so yeah, I, where where do you go from here yeah i think it is difficult to generalize at this time uh, certainly we have the individual uh, example many example we have that the uh, many soft uh, caring men is very much uh, uh, felicitated uh, acknowledged and and the celebrated but at the same time when we see the, like the marriage institution 
and uh, in india now the online marriage registration is going on matching the couple what is their information they are asking and that information is age height color and the uh, and the income that is associated with the marriage so that is this is also confusion that the what really uh, women want uh, what types of masculinity and i one thing i want to add here uh, i remember the um, sanjay sivastav professor sanjay sivastav that always say there is masculinity is very fragile so men also his huge fear to save that manhood the concept of manhood so that is the associated with the women also so it doesn't mean that the one time they have established they will uh, they will live with their establishment for long yeah yeah, yeah. that's that's how it is fluid and um, that's right but i think there must be some way to move away from that hegemonic understanding of that uh, that expectation you know if there are men who are challenging it then how do you promote that kind of alternative thinking in this Amtiaz, you are, you have come back. You you have a point on this. Um, I would I would suggest uh, if uh, okay because there's another four five minutes and there are many good questions here. So but I think we will have to really deal many of these questions offline. Uh, people can ask you uh, the panelists, but I think we'll we'll have another. Another uh, other time for two to two questions answer. So yeah, Baba, you were you were trying to answer, I suppose. Yeah, please you can repeat the question. Uh, no, I okay. So let me just ask this question: Is there a way to counter toxic ma masculinity that is direct byproduct of cultural and traditional normalization of aggressive masculine behavior? gender discrimination and male privileges is there a way to create spaces for young men and boys that are safe spaces but are positive and reaffirming with respect to gender equity equality and sensitivity as opposed to uh, niche uh, you know commerce that uh, promote negative behaviors and stereotypes similar to locker room talks you know there was an incident mm. of locker room in india so mm. Are there ways to create safe spaces where you can bring the positive aspects of and uh, of these issues rather than giving vent to the negative aspects of this? So, yes, I think Ravi. I mean, this is something very interesting because I mean, from our own work experience uh, over the last, I would say, two decades, what we have learned is yes, men really do need safe spaces basically, and this is what I have experienced very. From very uh, the work from the ground as well. Like when we, I'm I'm talking about young men and boys in the communities, and we just start talking. Okay, let's we, why we are here and and uh, building a kind of a common vision of what kind of society and what kind of uh, community we really want. We really and and interestingly, when we talk about the vision, so most of the time they do talk about. They do not want. Violence in the community. They do not want like uh, there is a more injustice in the community. They do not want like uh, if there is any kind of discrimination in the community. And then building on that common vision is basically like where we provide that uh, kind of a space to uh, men and boys. And here I feel like the connect connection is basically there because at that point they are really able to connect the discussion out there with their own self because. My experience is until and unless we really bring in your own self into that discussion, it becomes something out there. And if something out there, you always feel disconnect basically with that whole discussion basically. So I really, I mean, appreciate that question. Like, yes, it's not like like men are really looking for some kind of space. In. This is my experience. They really want. They really want. They really and they are really many times they really want to unlearn as well. They really want, like they really, they really want to contribute to that discussion. But at times they really lost. They really, they do not find, find like oh, what to do and how to do. This is the main question for us. I think that we really need to address. Thank you, thank you so much. Ravi, yes, yeah. Ravi, can you hear me yeah. now? Okay, very yes, quickly. Yes. I mean, um, about the question on structure and governance, which I, I want to start from there. 
Look, yes, it's true that in all the South Asia, every country has different governance system and the structure is very different. But at the same time, we have one very common structure and which is patriarchy. Patriarchy might operate differently in different country, but it is it is working everywhere in South Asia. And with patriarchy, what comes is sun preference. And which is also related with your daughter and neglecting your daughter, marginalizing your daughter. So I think one very important point is that we have a common enemy and that common enemy many, manifests itself in many different ways. And there are certain ways through which we can definitely work with this one. So that is one very point. Good. About governance, governance is very important issue. So India, what um, the BJP is doing, we have religious party in Bangladesh who are not in power and therefore definitely we are enjoying certain autonomy and less a certain benefit, which might not be present in Pakistan or might be it's very different. So it's a very valid question and the problem is there. Now about coming to the point yeah. of positive masculinity. Well, then my experience is when we are working with feminist framework, that is law, many men who also appreciate us, especially the fathers who have daughters. And interestingly, also we are now observing feminist movement leaders of court hardcore feminist leaders, they're also accepting us as, as feminist um, uh, activists. So this is a very huge change I see, but at the same time, when you are going to cook, I mean, a lot of my students, a lot of my, my kids with whom I work as part of Brave campaign, they said, look, all the women in our house, they don't like us to do this. So this is the emphasized femininity. We know that it is there and it's because of patriarchy. So uh, let me let me stop here. Yeah, thank you. Oh, thank you. I think I'm left only with one minute, I suppose. And I had such an interesting question here from someone who wanted to know, have you guys ever been pushed back by your feminist friends and feminist -less groups as male activists? And what have you had to struggle to build a trust with them? And what was that kind of a trust? But I think I will not go into ans uh, seeking answer because I'm left with 30 seconds. I just want to thank you all. Thank uh, Align uh, and ICRW again to give this platform. I really thank all four of you for being so enthusiastic and such energized conversation. You have been bold, you have been passionate, and I think you have you have put your point so upfront that it is uh, it is for many of us. I learned so many things today from each one of you, um, and and I'm, I'm saying it on there's a lot a uh, lot to go. So. I thank uh, the team out there. I would not dare to summarize now anything. Uh, Rachel, you are on, on video. You want to say something? Yes, please. So again, on behalf of Align, I just wanted to thank Anand and Tia, Satish, Papa, and of course, Ravi, for your chairing. Thank you all for your insights. And the, the final thing I wanted to say was that there were a number of questions that we didn't have a chance to answer today. Um, if the participants don't mind, we would do is circulate those questions by email, see if we could gather some responses and then post them on the Align website um, once we've done that. So um, please uh, do look out for that. Thank you all very much indeed for your participation in every way that you have. Um, it's late now, it's South Asia region, so I wish you all a very pleasant evening. Thank you again, and we look forward to continuing the conversation in your insights. Please do feel free to contact Align to share any other thoughts, experiences, case studies, reports, and so on that you might have. So thank you all, and good night. Thank you. Thank, thank, you, you, so thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. It was a real good discussion. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. -bye.